You remember those days? <laughs> We're old man. We're getting old. <laughs> we gotta buy some Grecian formula. Yeah, you can swipe those two. <laughs> hey, Mark. So if you just say you know, to the camera that. Right, eh? Hi, I am Guillermo del Toro, and you're watching El Rey Network. Yeah. Here we go. For set. And action. So we're sitting here in Austin, Texas, in yes. one, of the, one of the many dungeons of Troublemaker Studios, <laughs> surrounded by original paintings by the master Frank Frazetta. Mythical. I thought it would be a fitting surrounding for someone as accomplished artistically as you. I find that's geeky. Um, <laughs> you know, I know you quite well. You've lived in Austin before. We started at the same time, about yeah. 20 years ago. And I'm still just blown away by your artistic abilities, your creativity, yeah. and the films you make, especially when I just rattle off your filmography. Kronos. Mimic. Devil's Backbone. Blade 2. Hellboy. Pan's Labyrinth, Pacific Rim, and now The Strain, a series based on your three novels. How's your sleep? You know, I don't sleep much. It's, <laughs> it's like I consider uh, what I do my joy, my hobby, my life, you know? And, uh, and I think that makes it, we're not workaholics. We have to work hard at life. Right. This is what we do. It shapes us, you know, our beginnings and how we start. How did you begin? And did you always feel a draw toward, towards being a filmmaker or just an artist in general? I always liked film since I was a kid. I started at eight. That's when I first took my first Super 8 reel to the pharmacy. Back then you took them to the pharmacy. That's right. They came back a week later, <laughs> you know? And I opened it, I put it on a projector, and to this day I'm 49, and the most thrilled I've ever been, seen, been about making movies is that first time. I turned Imagine. on the projector and you went, I did that. It recorded it and recorded, now it's yeah, playing back. What I, it was a movie, but I have made it. It never got any more absolutely magical than that. Pure. Pure. Was there an industry that you could then look towards as you found out about movies there in Mexico? How, was, how did that work? Did you ever believe that you could actually make the leap to no, be a filmmaker? In that, in that, I think we're similar because I always wanted to do horror films and fantasy films and strange movies. And people were thinking, what is this guy gonna really do? Because A, in Mexico, all the industry is in Mexico City, in the capital. And uh, Guadalajara is the second city, but there was no real industry. And in Mexican cinema, most of the time, genre filmmaking has been done, with very few exceptions, like Carlos Lopez Moctezuma. You know, it's been done for exploitation. And I didn't want to do exploitation, I knew that. I thought I could do beautiful stories that were almost like fairy tales with horror, you know? Right, right. Like rather than me molding myself to the world, I thought if I can will the world to understand what I want to do, and you just, you're like a, like a donkey, you're like a stubborn working animal and you keep going and going and going until one day you realize it's happening. What led you to, to make your first film, Kronos? What was the leap from being a fan of film to a maker of a film? Because it's so accomplished. It's a long leap. The government organism in Cine really didn't want to support Kronos. Right. So the government, they would give you $400,000, which was a huge amount of money. I came in, I did the storyboards, I built the machine, I showed them photographs, scouting, conceptual paintings, and they kept sending me back and back and back. Alfonso Cuaron, Emmanuel Lubezki, we were all friends, we were part of the circle. They all said, go make the movie whichever way you can. And I was fabricating my own machine, it was horrible. And all of a sudden, I meet Berto Navarro and Guillermo Navarro. Right. And they believed in me and Berta said, I I'm gonna support you, I'm gonna produce it for you. And uh, I showed her my sketches, she loved them. And it took four years of rejection, like 20 drafts wow. of the screenplay. And finally, Imcine said, okay. So we went and started the movie. I was very ambitious. I want to do the machine really well. I want to do it in gold. I want to do the little insect really well. I want the makeup to be really good. I want to build that billboard gigantically in the middle of the roof. 
One of my most prized possessions is the, is the Kronos <laughs> device that you gave me way back when. Way back and when. You, and you said, here, so we can live forever. There it is, my friend. <laughs> Look at that. There's, there's very few of these left because I made them from the original mold. Yeah. And this is silver and gold, by the way, in case you're in Ever in <laughs> night really money, to run, I, I, I want to I live forever or something. But what is great is you have here the this is a, a snake biting its own tail, which means eternity. You have the up and down, the, these are dragons. I mean, there's a lot of, and there's a little inscription there, suo tempore, which means everything at its own time. And it's a beautiful design. But it's also, I mean, it's just also very, it's also very you. I wanted to ask you just about your design sense. And, and I saw your books. Um, yeah. You printed one and it still doesn't even do the real book justice. I mean, oh, no. there, right here, this is great. Look at this. I mean, this book is amazing. They're so intricate in drawings and ideas, and it, every corner of the page is filled. Yeah. And, and you can, no matter, and, and I draw, and I have journals, but they're like the first three pages are drawings, and the rest is blank. And then I saw <laughs> this like, yours were filled. I mean, I would be so afraid of just the originals just being lost, but yeah. also just how much is in your head. It's like a snapshot of what's in your head. But very little. It's so amazing. It's funny because that book that we published publishes about a fifth of the pages I have. Yeah. And what I draw is about a, a hundredth of what I think, you know? I don't care how accomplished you are as an artist, you can't help but look at that and just feel like Salieri seeing the pages <laughs> of Mozart handwritten and go, my God, if this is what's in his head. Yeah. Having seen the artist that I knew you were, I found it very frustrating that you were being questioned by a studio so much when you went and did Mimic. That's the only bad experience I've ever had making a movie. But but even that, Which is funny. I want to make I want to mention that only because from that comes great things, and, and I think this is very inspiring to artists who feel like they're blocked or can't work in a system. I want to hear a little bit about that story because it would inspire them to break through. Mimic, I felt the need to defend it from a creative point of view. I became really feisty and, and learned to fight for what I believed in. I learned to identify when someone was trying to interfere creatively really early. And it was at the same time my daughter was born. And what I felt is, how can I raise my daughter if I don't have the guts to fight this process and win it? Right. Win it somehow. I, I knew in the middle of Mimic, I was watching my dailies. It's one of my movies that I love the way it looks. And I thought, at least I'm winning a lot of the content. From that moment on, I try to put as much storytelling in the design and the colors and the cinematography and the way we light it and the way we, as in the story. So it gets, it gets in somewhere. Because that 50% they don't watch. <laughs> and that 50% you can, you can go by. And I think it changed me for the better because I, ha I came from a very protected environment. Mm -hmm. And an environment where, you know, you make movies with your friends. Mm -hmm. and therefore you have complete trust. One of the hardest words for me to say back then was no. Right. And that word I learned on Mimic. I remember you called me because you were filming that movie yeah. and, uh, and said, Robert, they're, they're, they want me to finish shooting by Christmas. There's no way it's gonna happen. They want me to have a second unit director film. I had fired already three guys. Plus, plus they had to not just do that. second unit shots, they had to actually direct scenes with actors. So, yeah. so you said, could you come direct this stuff for yeah. me? I was fascinated by the process because you gave me script pages, you told me, you even gave me some boards. Yeah. And it's still, so, it, it taught me so beautiful much. Beautiful boards they were, were they by beautiful Leo boards. Duraniana. But yeah. even then, it's so hard to get into someone else's head. And uh, you don't know this, but I went into a room with them, they put me in a room and they were like questioning every part of the script. What about this, what is about the, this? Is the what only about time that? that ever happened, is, the, is also the only time, my, my frustration was so big, that is the only time in my life when I've used second unit. Yeah. I have well, never no used it. There's no need. There's and no I think it's an incredibly wasteful practice, in my opinion. What a lot of people don't understand is that you can give the same screenplay, the same boards to two it's directors, directors, three directors, and it's completely different scenes. Same, yeah, Jim Cameron point. says very beautifully, he says, second unit is a lose-lose proposition. He says, because if it's bad, it's terrible, and if it's good, it's worse. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> I just found it fascinating that um, I it's would horrifying. shoot a sequence, yeah, shoot a sequence that you'd give me storyboards to, and that told me to walk to the script. And fortunately, you got to you 
somehow they found the time for you to go reshoot it. You yeah. know, they gave you the extra time. And I would watch the comparison, and it's like, yeah, the, you can't get those nuances. You have to believe in the well, artist. It's different. It's, like, to, it's, it's a completely different thing. It's like it's, have, it's the it's same board, same script, but at the same time, in I, your head, I, so I much the opposite head. because when you shot the sh the Joe's rolling storyboards, you were doing things that I wouldn't do, and I liked them. I like you, you, like he would go for the cord, and the camera would push in, and I liked that, and then you would go pushing you up on mm -hmm. his feet as he. And I, and, I, and I like it. And the ones that didn't rhyme with the style is the ones that you have to reshoot. Yeah. For example, when uh, I had to reshoot one scene you had shot or two, you know? At, at least two. At least two. And then we were, there was a couple that stayed, a shot is you, a shot is me, <laughs> the middle is me, the other one is you, you know. But it's very subjective but, um, too. So it's they can, if they don't trust you, they will question everything. everything. Look, financiers, the studios, the money guys are almost like gazelles in an African jungle. <laughs> they all move like that, uh, and they hear a little noise, and they all run, ah, you know, <laughs> scared, horror, leaving poop behind, you know. And they are really, really skittish. So they never really want to trust you, because money is the only language they understand most of the time. And creativity really sees money as a tool. Yeah. Uh, but most of the people involved at, at the financing level learned the wrong lesson. I remember a joke they used to say about a, 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 an alcoholic that went to a conference about alcohol and they showed him a glass of alcohol and they tossed the worm, the flesh of the worm dissolving the alcohol. <laughs> and they said, what did you learn today? And he said, that if I drink, I won't have worms. So that, that is like, <laughs> right. they, they always the come to the wrong conclusion. Right. And you know, I remember very distinctly the reason why I was able to finish Mimic was Mira Sorvino. Because Mira went toe to toe with the studio and said, I want him to direct it. Right. I want him to stay. And it, this, this is curious. I was editing every day on Mimic. Why? Because I was fearing if I, if I get fired, I will walk away with the movie up until the point I had it. Right. And I can show it. I was so, so innocent. I show it around that. and say, look, I was doing no, no, good. No, 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 this is the real. <laughs> like a crazy man in right. the invasion of the body snatchers. It was a good movie. But, but I was doing that and I was showing it to Mira and the cast every day on the set. I would bring the dailies from the day before. And they were seeing I was doing a really good movie. And so when, they, when the time came to have a showdown, Mira said, I know he's making a good movie. You don't have to tell me he's making a good movie. And that, that changed a lot. And, and to this day, I cut every day, I show it to the actors. A thing that I learned on, on Mimic, I'm now six weeks ahead of schedule and post. Wow. You know, and, and it's because I cut now I got almost fine during the shoot yeah. because I got on camera, like you do. Right. Yeah. After Mimic, you said it took you a number of years to get a movie yeah. going. Was it only because of the business? Did you believe in your instincts then, or were your instincts ever questioned because of the, what you oh, wanted? No, no, no. Look, I think that it is something that made difficult the dialogue with the industry. And, and to this day, I mean, I've, had, uh, I've always had the regret of the movie that didn't get made. Because mm -hmm. I, I can imagine my life having done Kronos, doing Mimic the way I wanted it, my career and my life would have been different. As it is, Mimic almost destroyed me. Right. I, don't, I, I went three years without being able to lift another movie off the ground. It was until Almodovar came to me and said, I want to produce Devil's Backbone. And Michael De Luca in New Line said to me, I want to give you Blade Two. Those were the two things that changed my life, but I could as easily yeah. not have recuperated. I knew that my soul was dangling from a thread. I don't understand Blade. I would spend the whole movie on the side of the bad guy. Here we go. For set. Here we go. For set. And action. Devil's Backbone. How did that come about? I always say jokingly my first movie was Devil's Backbone but I, I really mean it. It was the first time I could be me and I had enough money to support my vision. So how did that come about? You, you, you couldn't get a movie launched in the States after Mimic, and then it was back to basics. You went back and did it in, your, in Spanish. Habéis oído? Un suspiro. Yo no nada. What happened is, Pedro Almodovar was in Miami, and he said to me right away, and I still do the same as a producer, I approached the director and I said, I want to produce your movie, period. 
because that that's what Pedro did in Miami. Right, he said, I want to produce your movie, and I went, God. It empowered you. It empowered you. Instantly. And then he came to Guadalajara to eat at my house while my father was kidnapped. Between Mimic and the kidnapping, which was a tough year. Yeah. And I pitched him the idea. It's a ghost story with a bomb and the civil war, and he was eating his food at my house, and he says, it sounds really strange. He says, it sounds like actually like two movies. <laughs> are you sure you're gonna able to combine it? I said, look, some people will never believe that, that they are compatible, but I have faith I can make them. And then I made a really good decision. Pedro Almodovar wanted to uh, mount the movie and, and have it shot, I think it was around May or something like that of that year. And, and New Line wanted Blade to go right away. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, can you postpone Devil's Bag one? And we'll give them money and, 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 and I felt in my gut I, I shouldn't do that. I should first get my bearings as an artist and protect what is completely mine. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, if, I, if you really want me to do Blade 2, you'll wait for me. And I said, I'll shoot Devil's Bag one, I'll cut negative in 12 weeks and I'll start pre-production on Blade 2. And that's how it happened. But it, easily I could have been afraid and go, oh, I'm gonna do the Hollywood movie first. Right, right. And I'll wait on the Spanish movie. But I knew that my soul right. was dangling from a thread if I didn't do Devil's Backbone first. It was like the anti-mimic. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So it was complete freedom. And then I went to the Blade, which was, frankly, a blast. Now, why did you do Blade 2? I remember one of the things that people were saying uh, after Mimics, uh, he, he, he can shoot quiet, strange things, but he cannot shoot action. And so when they offered me Blade 2, I said, I'll do it without second unit. I think that part of me kept proving action, action, action until Pacific Rim, right. you know? My agent called me and said, they're offering you Blade 2. I said, you know, I love the vampires. I can bring this to the vampires. I have this idea that they open like this and all that, and uh, the biology, blah, blah, blah. He said, but I don't understand Blade. Because if I was, I would spend the whole movie on the side of the bad guy, <laughs> you know? And I went and see Wesley, and Wesley laughed, and he said, that's cool, that's cool. We want you to bring that weirdness oh, that's cool. to the to the movie. If I did my job right, you feel that the bad guy is a tragic character. You feel for him. Normally on, on a Blade movie, you want Wesley to give a one-liner, kill the guy, and the audience claps. <laughs> but hopefully you're ambivalent about Nomax. You created one of the best vampires since, since Nosferatu, which was your the Reaper, Reaper yeah. which was mostly, it was all practical, right? You mean it was practical, but then we did, see, Blade 2 has some of the best digital effects ever, and some of the worst digital effects ever. <laughs> like, they, it has both. We were trying digital doubles, which is something no one That was try. too early back then. Yeah, yeah. I think it, still to this day, I don't think no one does really perfect digital doubles. But the makeup, the digital makeup of the Reapers is, to this day, you can watch it and it holds. It beautiful. holds up. I mean, I couldn't tell. I couldn't yeah. tell and, and I, how I, you did that. I wanted so much that moment where the camera lingers and the guy licks the head and then. And then in the same take, it opens up. It's, it's shocking. Like, wow, yeah, what the it's, hell is it's very exciting and, 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 and to see something new like that. And, and the thing is, what was funny and mimic, it was I, I almost wanted to grab them by the lapel and go, I know effects better than because, like you, I'm, I'm, I, I, I knew it. I was a, I was a grunt for twenty projects. I was in movies. I knew how to do the boom. I knew how to do the exposure. I knew how to do squibs. I knew how to do everything. And that the effects background helps you a lot into breaking it into elements. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna change to right. a puppet. You know where you're gonna, you know. Animation. You just, you know, you're just, you're more empowered as an artist. You're you more, know you, where things go. You can you're direct more actors, but you, well, you can also break down a, a makeup effect. And that makes you technically have an edge. Yeah. 
I mean, tech, uh, some of my favorite filmmakers are the ones who mix technology with creativity. Jim Cameron, George Lucas, yeah. John Lasseter, very creative, but also very technical. I'd put you in that category. Your, your techni technique is impeccable. It helps mm -hmm. you creatively solve a problem that somebody who knows that technique would never figure out. And you did some amazing work. And I mean, the fights and the, you, we're big Kung Fu fans here at El Rey Network. Where do you get your sense of all your fights, even from Pacific Rim to Blade, are very tightly choreographed, very intricate. Is that something that you look at passionately? Well, I started, I, well, of course, I'm the same Kung Fu fan than you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up wanting a six pack like Bruce Lee, but I never got it. I got the, <laughs> I got the, the other approach. <laughs> but I would come up with crazy ideas. Action! Mostly from Kung Fu comedy. Right. The first Blade, that was one of the things I loved, that he, it brought a mixture of tough street fighting with Kung Fu, with martial arts. Wesley is a really good fighter. But then I would, I, I would look at them in a master shot, you know? They show you the fight, and then you have to imagine how to make them more kinetic. And that was the other thing that was great. The final shot on Mimic, the, the explosions, we shot in one night or two nights with 11 cameras. So I learned to choreograph two, three cameras on Mimic on the beginning. And there is a scene on Blade Two, the scene where they are shooting at the walls in the nightclub and shooting everyone. And I, I did that one single set of 13 cameras. And I knew right. when they were gonna cross each other and I was gonna cut here to the other camera. It was a huge process, but Mostly it was just joyful then. Why Ron Perlman? Ron is basically what I want to be when I grow up. Most everybody gave up on the movie, and I never gave up. Here we go, for sight. Here we go, for sight. And action. Hellboy. Why Ron Perlman? It kind of reminds me of when I tried to convince people Mickey work was was Marv. I mean, they didn't understand it, but because when you work with an actor, I'd worked with him already on, on Once Upon a Time in Mexico, so I knew he was he him. was that guy. Nobody else would have that experience that I had. And they are they are similar characters in a way. Yeah, uh, very Marv similar. Marvin Hellboy, you know, yeah. with the trench coat and the tough. You need a particular actor for that, but you knew Ron from Kronos. Yeah. But it's also one of the greatest actor-director relationships like Chow Yun-Fat and John Woo, Scorsese and De Niro. <laughs> He's like your Danny Trejo. Why, why, what is it about What is it about the importance of the, those kind of relationships? I never really thought of it myself. I was wondering, wondering what your perspective is. Um, when an, and an actor and a director kind of do a series of films to get there, as great as Ron is, he's always even better in your movies. Just like De Niro is always better in Scorsese movies. Well, what is it about that relationship? Why do you go back to him? Well, you you, you have actors, or uh, like, is is important that you feel is the right project with your collaborator, be it an actor or a cinematographer. You you shouldn't do everything with the same guy all the time. Like for me to try to force Ron into Pan's Labyrinth would be wrong. Right. But. I naturally gravitate to Ron because Ron is basically what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> you know, so like, if I could grow up to be Ron Perlman, I would love that. So I, it's, it's like what they say about Hitchcock, Cary Grant is what Hitchcock wanted to be. Right. Absolutely true. Uh, I think that uh, with Ron, uh, I admired him enormously before Kronos. I was a huge fan of Name of the Rose, Quest for Fire, Beauty and the Beast, and so I, wrote for him, and I wrote Hellboy for him. Before writing Hellboy, I took him to the comic book store and I said, I'm gonna write this for you. And you have no idea how many times I got really big producers and really big studios say to me, we'll give you the money get somebody without else. Ron Perlman. Yeah. yeah, get somebody else. And I would say, what I learned on Mimic. I would say no. Yeah. I would say it's not my movie. And Ron was very moved, he said, that very big loyalty and all that. And I said, look, it's loyalty to the project. Yeah. If you you're the were right not guy right for the for project. It, yeah, I wouldn't, I'm not, this I, isn't for you. You're, no. you're the, you are Hellboy. He is. And it's he like, it's like that. You can't imagine Mickey work not being, you can't imagine never, Hellboy with somebody else. Or Danny Trejo. <laughs> or, yeah, or <laughs> Danny And also, like Danny Trejo, honestly, there's only one. Yeah. There's only one Ron Perlman, <laughs> only one Danny <laughs> Trejo. It's not like they are interchangeable. You're not talking about a bland day soap opera guy that looks like another 20. These are guys, I also come from, when I was a kid, my, my favorite movies were Lee Marvin movies. And Lee Marvin, James Coburn, these leading guys that were not 
handsome guys. Yeah, dude, they were, were real tough. faces. Right? Yeah, real faces, tough guys. Uh, like one of my favorite movies, is Emperor North. Robert Aldrich with Ernest Borgnine and oh, yeah, yeah. and Neil Marvin and the fight at the end with the with the axe and the chain, you know, it's such an, an amazing movie. And and you want, I want that on the screen. I just, I'm not interested in young people's movies. I'm interested in kids, monsters, or old people. Those are my ideals to have on the screen. Okay, so now, one of the more important films in your filmography is, is of course, Pan's Labyrinth. What did that do for your, your confidence as an artist and just the, the, the worldwide acceptance of, I was particularly just happy to see your books finally making it to the screen. the screen. What made you jump back to go make that movie that way? It's part of the sort of promise you do to yourself, you know? Because I just see such an important arc in your career of, of knowing when to go make something really personal, yeah. down and dirty, and the right way because you again you're protecting that process was yeah. that what that was about or yeah well it was it was look pants was an idea i had for many 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 years i went two three years without earning money because i, I needed to dedicate myself to writing that screenplay i'm a terrible businessman i never made any money from pants labyrinth it made over a hundred and something million between dvd and blah 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 nothing came to us right you know but be because we we all went at it as almost like a little quest but it was so difficult it's the second most difficult shoot i've ever had wow almost as difficult as me really really for very different reasons but it was a movie where three or four times very dear people very reasonable people people very close to me said give up wow that's amazing. and they said you shouldn't you're a stubborn moron <laughs> you should give up no one wants to make the movie wow and the three or four times that happened i learned what i learned on mimic and i said no and i said take my salary take whatever you need we're gonna keep going and i never gave up it was such a testament movie for me because i was talking about my daughter growing in a world that is really screwed up uh, my preoccupations of her giving up my preoccupation is that as a girl, everybody's telling her who she has to be. The ending of the movie talks about who I am. It says, uh, leaving little traces of his world for those that know where to look. And everybody at some point or another, I must say, most everybody gave up on, on the movie. And I never gave up. So how was the experience of Pacific Rim overall? I mean, it's, it's like uh, geeking out with friends. I supervise every shot, every episode. Here we go, for set. Here we go, for set. And action. So how was the experience of Pacific Rim overall? Amazing. It's just great. It's like uh, geeking out with friends. You know, there's footage of me repainting the set or two on Pacific Rim. <laughs> <with> <laughs> so you're still boy. in there doing the money. Well, yeah, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm like Peter or like you, I'm a model main maker and I, I still supervise everything to the, to the tiniest detail. Pacific Rim, if it's a button in a jacket, I can tell you why we did it. Some of the choices I think were right, some of the choices were wrong here and there, but you at least know why you got there. I wanted to make a summer movie that was not a summer movie that looked like a summer movie, felt like a summer movie, but it was going against the grain on many things. So preserving things like the flashback with the girl with the little red shoe, or the birth of the kaiju with the umbilical cord tied to the neck, things that were not normal in a movie that size, not just going for car chases or this and that. Those are the choices that I think you gotta be minding. Even on Mimic, even on Mimic, the, the sequence I'm the proudest is the killing of the kids. Right. Yeah. You know, because one of the rules that was given to me on the beginning of Mimic was we shouldn't kill kids or dogs. <laughs> that's what and I killed, I killed the dogs and the kids and that's it. So another project I want to talk about because I went through something like this too and it's always, again, any project that you feel like you should do, sign up for it, even if it doesn't go to completion. You went and spent several years working on The Hobbit, which didn't go. What did you, what, 
and then came back and did Pacific Rim. What did you learn from that experience about much, making a much bigger movie? Well, first of all, living in New Zealand was easy. It was really great. I mean, I could have stayed there five years and not make a movie. That was, that was the thing. <laughs> I spent two years there and I was so happy. I gained like 90 pounds. <laughs> they have really great desserts. They have great ice cream, great food. And you're spending your time with filmmakers. You're with Peter, Philippe, and, and Fran. And so you're having a really good time. I was directing, art directing, the, the biggest movie I've ever done. I, I, I color coded it. I, I worked with Weta very, very deeply. And so it was really a great experience. And without that experience, I couldn't have done Pacific Rim. I, I, when I think about the big movies, I, I can see how somebody can get spoiled by only making big movies. Mm -hmm. I can see how somebody can get afraid of making big movies. So, you know, but if you reflect and you go through both, you, you grow. There's a lot of lessons you can take from the independent world in your smaller films into the bigger films. But because I haven't gotten as far as you've gone, what have you learned from the, doing these bigger projects that you can take back to your smaller films or to television where you have more limited means? I mean, what do you... You just, I'm sure you just learned so much from those. It's, it's absolutely true. Like, I, I couldn't have done the Pan's Labyrinth without doing Hellboy. Right. Because it's not that you're learning, you're trying tools that, with resources. You know, meaning I have the money to pay to someone to make a character that is a mixture of CG and practical, like on Blade or, or on, on Hellboy. And then I can apply it to Pan's Labyrinth. I, I can manage VFX at a larger scale more efficiently, and that allows me to do all the VFX on Pan's Labyrinth for three million bucks. Right. You know, or now uh, on Crimson Peak, we're doing them for about two. Wow. You know, and, 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 and that's why I also like going from 98 days of shoot on Pacific Rim to 20 days of shoot on the string. Right. Now you're moving into television with a series based on your trilogy of novels that you've done in your spare time. Yeah. How is how's the experience producing and direct, you direct some of them, I'm sure. At least yeah, yeah. I directed the pilot. Okay. But what I do is I'm I'm the I'm the I, I have visual effects supervisor approval. Oh. Like I do I supervise every shot from the beginning. I block it. I supervise animation, I supervise integration, I supervise compositing, shading. On every, every episode? Every episode, yeah. all the episodes. I color correct all the episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, I did rewrites up to episode six or seven. Wow, wow. Uh, how many episodes? It's 13. How many days does it take you to get into the swing of the shorter schedule? <laughs> on the shorter schedule? No, on the shorter schedule, there's no swing. You gotta go in. Yeah, you have to go, you go like, oh my God. I mean, it's truly... Really Gone with the wind in the morning, Starsky and Hutch by night. <laughs> <laughs> exactly like this. But, but what, is, what was great on the strain is uh, it almost, not even Kronos was that short. Kronos was 40 days. Wow, well, that's which yeah, is super luxurious. And the strain was 20 days and I have a bunch of extras, a plane, an airplane, airport logistics, you know, shooting an airplane and an airport, and uh, it's a lot of, uh, for those that do it, you know. It's invigorating, it's, it's really exciting. It's like much going back better. in time. Yeah. It keeps you better. Mm -hmm. But I think if you stay just on one scale of movie, you can you can start acquiring. Atrophy. You know, atrophy, or you, you, you cannot shoot if you don't have a driver, and you have to mix down and dirty with big. When we come back, we're gonna do the uh, segment called Questions from other directors. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> so this is a section of the show where I've called other directors to ask you some questions. I owe them money. Here we go. For set. Here we go. For set. And action. So this is a section of the show where I've called other directors to ask you some questions. I owe them money. J.J. Abrams asks, do you write while listening to music? And if yeah. so, uh, what music do you listen to? Yeah, for example, I write always to music. I remember what I wrote with each, each movie. Uh, because I find that I start without music, because that's the hardest, like squeezing the words out. And then when I find a block, I put music and I can go another six hours. Right. Because I think that I work very con constantly. I, I am writing always because otherwise you get, it's like going to the gym, you know, 
I stopped going to the gym a week ago, which is two <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Whatever, you know, it's the right. same thing. But I write mostly to soundtracks. Mm -hmm. Although, for example, Pan's Labyrinth was written with a piece by a composer called Arbo Part, a piece, a piece called Spiegel on Spiegel, Mirror on Mirror, mm -hmm. and it's a little piano piece that always makes me cry, and I was always writing with that. Would you have it on repeat, on a loop or something? A loop, yeah. yeah. I can I can go on a on a repeat for six hours before I notice. Right. Yeah. yeah. But re most of the time, soundtracks. I I wrote one whole script to only the laser disc of Dracula for oh. that reason, because it had an isolated sound effects and music track, and it would flip automatically, and, played it. and it just looped. And when it so would you'd get, have the pioneer. So you'd have the, the pioneer. pioneer. <laughs> so when it would get, and it would be sound effects too. So it wasn't just music, but there was no dialogue. And when it would get to the to the chases, <laughs> your writing would get. You would you would almost pace yourself to that. And I played that for days, just that same. And it was it had so much variation. It really was. When you mentioned that, it really was one of those. It's like lifting best. weights, you know. Like like you can you can press X, but if you put a had like a black metal, you can press a little more. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> it's the same thing. You can press a little more with soundtracks. Uh, terrific horror director, friend of El Rey, really great guy. El Eli Roth says, Guillermo, as master of monsters, how do you bring your monsters to life? Meaning, how do you take what's there in your head and build it live? How much trial and error is there before a monster is fully alive? Designing is like casting. The more you know who you are starting the process with, the closer you get. Like Mike Mignola can design a certain type of monster, but not every monster. Like Mike's monsters are so sympathetic. They're so cute, so adorable. But he can also make a powerful, menacing, sort of a god type of monster. So you, you, you need to think of the designers in terms of casting. The same way that you would give Mickey Rourke uh, um, Marv, but maybe you wouldn't give him the suave CEO of, or whatever, right? Yeah. There are parts they cannot play. Yeah. So it's like casting, you cast it perfectly. And the one thing that you try to do is avoid cliche. The one thing I never looked at designing monsters is other people's monsters. Yeah. Like when I was designing the robots on Pacific Rim, the last thing I looked at was robots. I was looking at planes, submarines, tanks, or for example, in monsters, most everybody sculpts the furrowed brow. You know? Right. And when I see that brow, I, I, <laughs> you go, smooth it out I go to the clay. the clay and I say <laughs> to them, nobody is like that all day long. So you gotta sculpt him in a neutral mm -hmm. and then let the actor give that expression. You right. know? I remember uh, also one Harryhausen role which says there, not, there needs to be a majesty and a beauty to the monster right. in repose. Hmm. So those are rules that I live by. And finally, it's as important what you put in as what you leave out. Right. So people that do the monster and give him teeth and spiky hair and five eyes and, and gills and, and, and tentacles and <laughs> everything, it ends up ruining the profile of the monster if you put too much. So you need to be actually very elegant in designing the, the profiles of the monsters and so forth. John Landis. <laughs> Director of Animal House, Blues Brothers, and An American World. I'm familiar with the man. <laughs> and he has a terrible nickname for me. Oh, yeah. He said, please start the questions from John Landis for Guillermo with Dear Sucker. He said, you can cut it out later, but Guillermo <laughs> will appreciate it. What aspect of the filmmaking process do you enjoy the most and why? It seems to be different with every yeah, director I've I talked think to. post-production. Post, really? Wow. Because, uh, but, I, but that changes from project to project. Like, the best shooting experience I've ever had was Crimson Peak. I love discovering with the actors every day. You know, yeah. I, I was there every morning with my proposal, but I was so happy to mold the scene with them. So it changes, but normally post-production because you just have what you have. It's not a blueprint where you draw this and that. You have 50 bricks, two windows, one door. You didn't get five steps, you got three. Right. And then you assemble the house, for real. Right. So I say that you write a movie two times, one on the, on the typing machine and one in the editing room. Right. But really you write the movie in the editing room. Asked Francis Ford Coppola if he had a question for you. And he did. And it's a great question. He said, Guillermo, with such a fertile imagination, what techniques do you use to thin out or do less and try to focus in on essentials? What you need to do is really, uh, if you can live without it, leave it behind, you know? In designing, for example, in designing 
one, one of my philosophies I learned from uh, theater design, where uh, an opera design, where each set has one statement. For example, in Pan's Labyrinth, the captain's room is a, a giant gear with other gears next to it. And the pale man is a table with a chimney. But each set... You take out things so that take people out things that you don't focus need. on what it, the storytelling of the set. Of the set. So well, what, part yeah. is, what part of the set is telling the story? Right. And then that's the part you focus everything. And the rest needs to fall, not, not away, but be secondary to that. So, I mean, and then I, you can't change your mind. You can't change <laughs> your mind. Now, Francis, unfortunately, I don't know how to not do... I mean, I'm, I'm a glutton <laughs> in life and in film, so I, I give up... I, I only give up things when they take them out of my, my <laughs> cold hands, you know? Right. So if you think about my movies, I can do something intimate like Devil's Wagon or something big like Pacific Rim, mm -hmm. something funny like Hellboy or something really tragic like Pan's Labyrinth. Seemingly, they wouldn't have anything to do with each other, and yet, if you look for me, I'm there. You demand of yourself to articulate who you are. People think that the director is just an exercise in a void, where you exercise pure control. And the reality is that directing is the negotiation between what is there and what you want. Be it daylight, be it an actor that is not responding, an effect that is not working, or a studio that doesn't like the dailies. You cannot lock yourself and say, it's either my way or I don't do it. You have to make your way pliable. You have to be, like Bruce Lee would say, like water. You have to fill the void. Self-reflection is extremely important as a storyteller. There are no bad experiences and rarely do you have a wrong choice. But if you don't reflect about your own life and your own career, you can blindly find yourself cornered in a place that may have been easy or hard, but you didn't learn how you got there. You have to question yourself. You don't have to feel that comfortable in your own skin. You have to, to always feel on the verge of catastrophe and and if that happens then you know you're really growing well, your films are timeless because they not only enlighten with their storytelling and their creativity but because they're such great examples of your creativity this is Guillermo del Toro very happy to have him with us here in the Be director's chair thank you senor Número uno, Enrique.